Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're having a beautiful day. And in today's video, I'm gonna be sharing my process for painting this realistic study of a red bell pepper using watercolor pencils. I'm gonna be sharing my entire method with you. There are many different ways of using watercolor pencils as I've explained in past watercolor pencil tutorial and tips videos that I've shared, which I'm gonna make sure to link to down below in the description box in case you'd like to go and check them out uh, because they definitely serve as a kind of intro, especially if you're just getting started with this drawing slash uh, painting medium that watercolor pencils offer. But I'm gonna show you step by step what it is I personally like doing, starting with choosing my colors using a reference photo, then moving on to working on my preliminary freehand pencil sketch, and then moving on to the layering using watercolor pencils. There are definitely going to be a couple of little tricks or hacks or little special things that I do that you may have not heard of before. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I have found out about them and I've loved using them so far. So I'm gonna be sharing that with you today as well. All right, so without much further ado, let's go ahead and get started with selecting the specific group of colors that we're gonna be using for this piece. I've talked about this extensively before, but it's so important to choose the specific colors that you're gonna be using, especially if you're looking for higher levels of realism and also just to make sure that you're preventing accidents and you know things like muddy colors and colors that you really weren't going for. Uh, so it's important to make sure not only that this is the specific color that you want, but also if you're gonna be blending colors or layering colors together, that these are colors that are gonna work well together. And this is exactly what I am doing right here on this scrap piece of watercolor paper. Uh, my scrap pieces of watercolor paper usually are old paintings that didn't work out that I just cut up into uh, little pieces because I always need to have a scrap piece of watercolor paper or two on hand when I am painting with watercolor. And basically what I do is after having chosen the reference photo that I'm going to be working with or I have something set in front of me that I am using to paint or draw from direct observation, I really take time to observe that subject and I take out of my tin, in this case, the little group of colors that I initially think that are gonna be helpful, taking those different hues or colors that I'm able to see in my subject, as well as the variety of values that I'm able to see within it. So we need to be able to develop a variety of different values, lightest lights, a wide range of midtones and darkest darks to create that sensation of three-dimensional form and arrive at a higher level of realism. Um, value is really one of the main things behind realism. So it's important to, since the beginning, set ourselves up for success by making sure that we have not only the right colors, but also that we've thought about how we're gonna be developing all of those different values. Uh, in many cases, when we're working with watercolor, we need to bring in a second or even a third color into the process to darken a color and really be able to develop those darkest darks. So that is why I am choosing these specific colors. I know that with the yellow, the light green and the darker green, I'm gonna be able to develop a wide range of values within the stem. And I know that by uh, me having prepared the orange, a medium red, and a darker red, I'm gonna be able to create a wide range of values within the body red section of the pepper. And the very last color that I'm going to prepare for myself is a dark brown. I don't really like using black unless I'm going for a very specific style or I am actually painting something that is black. Um, I usually find that dark browns or even other color mixtures create better looking, more natural looking color. So I take out that dark brown from my set and right there at the bottom of this scrap piece of watercolor paper, I am going to be testing out that dark brown. I place that darkest red and the darkest green right beside that brown. And right here, I am not only swatching out the brown in and of itself to 
see the color there, but I'm actually going to be testing out how it mixes together with one of the reds and one of the greens, the darkest of the two. This way, there is much less of a chance that I'm gonna end up creating a color that I really didn't want. Here, as you can see, I am not just testing out these colors, but I'm also activating them with water. So I'm just going over that color with a little bit of water in my watercolor paintbrush. Uh, why? Because this is something that I am actually going to be doing along the process. I like activating the color with water. The reason why I like doing this is because I like using this medium to its full capabilities, right? Because if I wasn't going to activate it with water, then I just be better off using my regular Prismacolor pencils that are not water soluble. So when I am creating a piece using watercolor pencils, I like playing with what the medium allows me to do, right? And watercolor pencils have this ability to create painterly like effects, but at the same time create texture sort of similar to regular colored pencils. And I really found that when using this medium, the texture of your paper has a huge impact on both your process and your end results. So just have in mind that the more textured your paper is, the less likely it's gonna be that you're gonna be able to deposit or layer that color on your paper smoothly. And the more likely it is that you're gonna end up with more textured results at the end. The actual watercolor paper that I'm gonna be using for the pepper study today is not the same one that is on screen right now with this scrap piece of watercolor paper. The one that I am using today for the study is from Strathmore. It's a piece of their ready cut watercolor sheets. Um, I actually cut the piece into a square format that's more suitable for this particular study. And this paper from Strathmore is 100% cotton. It's cold press and it's 140 pounds in thickness. And I really like it. It doesn't have very much texture at all. The watercolor pencils that I'm gonna be using today are from Derwent. They are their professional quality watercolor pencils and I just have their 12 color set. As always, you're gonna be able to find the supply list along with other downloadables at the end of this post. All right, so let's move on to the next part of this process. And this is the creation of that preliminary pencil sketch. So this is what I am doing right here on screen. And you can see how I am sketching this in very, very lightly. This is actually the lightness uh, that I use when I am creating my freehand sketches um, because of a few different reasons. Number one, I don't like my pencil showing through my color at the end. Number two, I am able to easily erase mistakes, which is important to do, especially when you're sketching freehand. And number three, I like staying away from scratching or damaging my paper because if I scratch or damage it, there is no taking that back and you're gonna be able to see those scratches at the end when I am done. So I am really sorry if this is very light, but this is actually the lightness of my pencil sketches uh, that I use prior to getting started with any sort of watercolor painting or watercolor pencil painting. All right, so I am done with my pencil sketch and I am moving on to the next part of this process. And here is one of the tricks that I wanted to share with you that you can maybe find handy for your next watercolor pencil project. So what you're gonna see me do right here is I am going to be blocking out my highlights using a regular white Prismacolor colored pencil. So this is not water soluble color like the ones that watercolor pencils offer. This is actually just a regular colored pencil from my Prismacolor Premier set and these are wax-based colored pencils, so not water-soluble pencils like the watercolor pencils from Derwent that I am using for the rest of this. Okay, so why does this work? Because this Prismacolor pencil is wax-based, which means that I can create a bit of a resist, a wax resist, to keep those highlights protected for me along the way, which is so important to do when we're working with transparent mediums like watercolors. When we're working with watercolors, whether it's paint or watercolor pencils, it's so important to acknowledge those highlights in our references or whatever it is we have in front of us 
so that we can plan for them and keep them protected throughout the coloring process. That light little layer of white color that I laid down is going to help me keep those very lightest lights protected along the way. It's going to impede that water soluble color from coming into these areas and darkening them that color is not going to be able to settle into and get absorbed into that paper because of the wax. When I'm working with watercolor and water soluble mediums, I like working from lightest to darkest. So I never get started without acknowledging my lightest values first and my highlights and make sure that I have them in mind throughout the entire painting process so that I don't accidentally cover them up and get rid of those lightest values, which are very much necessary if we're looking to develop a realistic study. So after having blocked out those highlights that I was able to see in my reference photo using my white Prisma colored colored pencil, I am now going in with my actual watercolor pencils to get started with the first layers of color. So I like working from lights to darks when it comes to using watercolor and watercolor pencils. So the very first color that I went in with for that first layer was my orange. I went over the entire body of this pepper with my orange, except for the white highlights, which were already protected with my regular Prismacolor pencil. And then I went over certain sections again with a second layer of this orange in darker value areas. With those first couple of layers of orange out of the way, I then switched on over to my first red. This is the lightest red of the two. And I am now going over certain areas, as you can see, really trying to stay away from lighter value areas. I'm just going in with a third layer and going into areas of darker values that I'm going to be developing. I am trying to keep my strokes consistent, but most of all, I'm just paying attention to lay down that color as evenly as the texture of the paper allows. And I'm really not pressing down very hard on my paper at all. I don't want to start scratching or burnishing it or anything like that. All right, so after having placed some of that first red in some of the areas of darker mid-tone values, I then switched on back to my orange to do a little bit of that blending between the colors. And I just wanted to add a little bit of extra color on my page before starting to activate my color with water. I wanna make sure that I have enough color on my paper before starting to activate it. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna start activating that color now with just a bit of water. I prepared my size 12 round brush by swiveling it in my container of water and then removing the excess water on my absorbent towel right there. You can see my absorbent towel on the left and I am constantly removing the excess water from my paintbrush bristles along the way because your paintbrush really just has to be a little bit damp and I find that the more water my paintbrush bristles contain, it's just easier to start losing control. And this is one of the reasons why I found it so helpful to create this wax resist with my regular colored pencil because once I start activating that color with my paintbrush bristles, it's very easy to start covering up those highlights by accident. So you do not need very much water at all. So do stay mindful of how much water is in your paintbrush bristles and also use your absorbent towel. If you find you've accidentally placed way too much water on your paper, uh, go in and do some lifting with your absorbent towel and constantly just check on that and dab your paintbrush bristles on your absorbent towel whenever you need to before going in. So hopefully by this point, you can see that I am still working around those highlights, but every time I go into those sections that I have blocked out with my white Prismacolor, that color looks super, super light, and it's not really getting settled or absorbed into the watercolor paper the same way as the color outside of those areas is getting um, absorbed. So I know that as I am painting, if I start losing track of where my highlights are 
and I'm painting over an area and I see this start happening in which that color is not getting absorbed into the paper, you feel it when you're painting, you should stop painting there because that's a highlight. You feel that smoothness of that wax in those areas as you're painting. So this is kind of similar to how I use masking fluid every now and then when I am painting with watercolor. I place my masking fluid to block out my highlights before starting to paint, and then I can just paint more freely along the way, knowing that those highlights are gonna stay protected from me. Only in this case, we actually laid down a tiny bit of white. Okay, so right here, I am done with that activation of my first layers of color in that red section of this pepper. And I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the first layers of color in the stem. So if you remember, the colors that I prepared for the stem are yellow, light green, and dark green. So what I am doing right here is, first, I lay down my yellow. I stayed away from the little sections of highlights that I had protected for myself with my white Prismacolor. And then just like what I did with the reds, I observed my reference photo. I acknowledge where the darkest green areas are located within the stem, where the midtones are and where the highlights are. And I didn't really try to copy everything bit by bit, but just acknowledging their general locations, you're able to use that information and inform your choices as to where you lay down your different greens that you're gonna be adding in. So again, working from lightest color to darkest color, I lay down the yellow first, then the lighter green, and then the darker green. And once I felt I had enough color on my watercolor paper, I then used my size three round brush. This is the smallest brush that I'm going to be using for this process today to activate these areas and blend out those greens. Whenever I am using my paintbrush and doing those brush strokes, I am always taking into account the texture of the element it is I am painting. So I observe my reference photo. I notice if I have a paintbrush type and size on hand that is going to more easily help me describe that texture. And I also modify and shift the way that I am creating those brush strokes, that I am laying down those brush strokes. So for example, for the stem, I see lines and I see a rougher texture when compared to the smoothness in the pepper's body. And of course, the stem is also smaller. So switching over to a smaller paintbrush that would allow me to carefully work around those highlights in this very small area and simultaneously using that paintbrush in kind of more vertical brush strokes that would help me to better describe those kind of lines that I see would be very helpful versus the body of the pepper, I try to use a larger paintbrush because I know that it's way more smooth. And even though, yes, this medium is probably going to lead in and of itself to a bit of texture at the end, using this paintbrush and paying attention to those brush strokes is gonna help me at least create somewhat of a different texture between the stem and the red part of the pepper. If I were to use a smaller paintbrush and do brush strokes with a smaller paintbrush in the red part of the pepper, that would probably create a visual texture that I don't want because every time you're laying down a brush stroke, you're creating a little abstract shape, right? And those abstract shapes can have sharp edges around them. And the more you lay down those brush strokes with a small paintbrush, you're gonna be creating more visual texture because you're creating more of those sharp edges around those abstract shapes that you're laying down. Versus if you do only a small amount of brush strokes uh, using a larger paintbrush, that is at the end going to lead to a smoother texture. When you're using a smaller paintbrush, you have to do, just as an example, 15 little brush strokes, right? Versus when you use a larger paintbrush, you only have to do two. And so if you use a larger paintbrush, it's gonna be much more likely that you'll end up with smoother results. Of course, though, when you're using a larger paintbrush, it's even more important that you stay mindful of the different value areas. 
and that you don't start just mindlessly flattening everything out and pulling your color into uh, lighter value areas or areas where you didn't really need that color to go into. So you can see how I've added a little bit of a cast shadow and even occlusion shadow effect right there under the bell pepper. So I basically went in with my medium red and my brown. I layered those two colors together and when I saw that I had a good amount of color on my paper, I then grabbed my size 16 round brush and activated that color with just a little bit of water in my paintbrush bristles and pulled that color outwards, creating a nice gradating effect into the whiteness of the paper. Uh, and basically I left the more darker saturated color under the pepper and made it more and more translucent as I pulled that color away into uh, the areas farther away from the pepper. And the way that you do this is just by removing the color from your paintbrush bristles and going back in with basically just water in your paintbrush and pulling that color outwards. Just making sure that you're staying in control of the amount of water, that you're not just going in with ton of dripping uh, from your paintbrush bristles or anything like that. Continue to help yourself with your absorbent towel. And of course, making sure that you're removing the excess drippage every time you're going into your water, you want to gently scrape your paintbrush bristles along the top of your container there so that you're not just dripping water all over the place. All right, so after having worked on that shadow area below the pepper, I allowed everything to dry completely. And this is very, very important because we're gonna be doing layering and you never, ever, ever want to go in onto a wet paper using a sharp tool like the watercolor pencils that we're using today because you can scratch and damage your paper. You don't want that. So allow everything to dry completely and I'm gonna allow everything to dry in between each and every layer that I create. Okay, so when we're going for higher levels of realism, usually it's all about that layering and having patience when um, continuing to build up all of those values, textures, details, and whatnot. So between those layers, it's important to allow everything to dry. With everything completely dry, I went into the red section of the spell pepper using my medium red once again. However, this time I focused on only laying down that color in darker value areas and allowing the previous layers of color that I've created to completely shine through untouched in lighter value areas. So I didn't mindlessly start just going in with more red all over the place. I am paying attention to my reference photo and I'm actually not adding any more color into lighter value areas. You can see how in several sections along the body of this pepper here, we still have that orange that we created in that first layer completely shining through, uncovered by this subsequent layer of color. So essentially we're working on mid-tones right now and we're leaving the lighter values completely untouched, maybe doing a little bit of gradating into them, but for the most part trying to leave them untouched and protected. We don't want to start flattening things out. And because we're working on mid-tones now, I no longer used the lightest colors of the groups that I had prepared for myself. So I no longer used the yellow when I added in another layer of color into the stem. And I no longer used the orange when I added in this new layer of color in the body of the pepper. I only layered that color in the areas that I wanted to darken further and left all of the lighter value areas untouched. And then once I felt I had enough color on my paper, I went ahead and activated that color with my paintbrushes using the same brush strokes that I was using before, only this time I am paying even more attention to making sure that I'm not pulling that color into lighter value areas as I am using my paintbrushes and that water. Yes, you can work on creating transitions between this new layer of color that you've created into lighter value areas, but don't just start bringing it into 
and covering all of the lighter value areas with this new layer of color that you've laid down. Essentially, as we move forward with our layering, as we start creating those darker value areas, we wanna stay even more mindful that we only leave that color in areas where we're actually trying to darken. Right here, I am jumping back to the shadow area below the pepper just to darken the area closest to the actual subject. This area was pretty much completely dry by this point, so I allowed myself to go in with my medium red and my dark brown once again, this time only in the areas closest to the pepper, so areas of occlusion shadow. Uh, just layering that color a little bit more so that it can just be more saturated and darker in this area. And once I felt I had enough color on my paper, I went ahead and started activating it again with my damp paintbrush and dissipated that color outwards. So essentially, if you want to see it this way, lighter value areas have less layering of color in them than darker value areas. In darker value areas, we're creating more layering and darkening that color. And this makes sense because when we're using a translucent uh, painting medium like watercolor, we're working in unison with the lightness and the whiteness of the paper under the color to create our different values. We're working together with the whiteness of the paper to create lighter values and midtones and darker values. So obviously, the more of that white of the paper that you cover up with more saturated color the darker the value versus the less amount of uh, color that you add onto the paper the more translucent and the lighter the value all right so i finished up with that second layer of color and activating that color with my paintbrushes to smooth out that color and also blend out that color and now after having allowed everything to dry once again for the second time I am going to go back into only darkest value areas to push those darks even more. And this time I am using my medium red, my darker red that I chose that I have not used so far. I am going to be using my dark green once again to push darkest green areas within the stem. And I am also bringing in the brown in both areas to push those very darkest dark areas. So right here, you're seeing me work on that layering. So I started once again with my medium red. I then used my darker red. I then used my brown. And you can jump on back to adding a second layer of the previous colors, a lighter red, the darker red, once the brown is already there, if you feel you could use a little bit more color before doing your blending. Um, and right here, I jumped on over to adding more color into the stem. So even in the stem, I am paying very, very close attention, especially because this is a small area. I don't want to start adding even more color into lighter value areas. I want to keep them protected. So here I am using the darkest green, and then I'm even going to be using the brown within this green stem. The brown really is only for the very, very darkest dark areas. So the darkest values that you see in the reference photo, those are the places where I'm adding in the brown. And I'm basically overlapping that brown onto the darkest color of the group. Once I had enough color in this new layer in the sections that I wanted to darken, I went ahead and started activating them once again. So I go through this entire process of allowing that layer to dry completely and then going back into darkest value areas to push those darks even more, making sure that I am selecting the right colors. So at this point, uh, the darkest red, the darkest green, and the brown really come into play. But I'm basically doing the exact same thing as I did before. I allow that layer to dry completely. I then layered that color in darkest value areas. I then activated that color, making sure that I am staying within that darker value area and just gradating that color a little bit into lighter values, but making sure that the majority of the lighter value areas are just untouched and uncovered by this new layer and then I allowed it to dry and so on and so forth 
until I arrived at a good range of values and a saturation that I liked. Right here you can see me use my smaller paintbrush as I am working on these darker value areas. Uh, using this smaller paintbrush allows me to have a little bit more control in terms of keeping those different values in their places, especially in smaller areas that I need to work around, like those little sections in the back part of the pepper, etc. So make sure that you're switching between your paintbrushes as needed. And I also want to mention if at any point throughout this process you like your study the way it is, you actually like uh, having that visible texture that the pencil allows and you don't want to activate it, you don't want to smooth it out, by all means, leave it the way it is. It's perfectly fine. And it's really all based on your own personal tastes. Okay, so I'm almost done with this layer and I'm gonna allow everything to dry completely before going in one last time with those watercolor pencils to apply even more color into darkest areas. This time I'm only going to be going in with my darkest red and my brown and if you need to darken areas even further in the stem you can also make sure to go in with your darkest green and if needed your brown as well. For me I already have enough brown in my stem so if anything I'm going to be going in with my darkest green just a tiny bit more. If you find that when you are using your paintbrush, you're spreading that color way too much, starting to lose control, and it's starting to cover up lighter value areas, simply remove the color from your paintbrush bristles and go back in with a clean and only slightly dampened paintbrush and pick up some of that excess color. I'm gonna go quiet as I finish up working on this and then I am going to explain this very last tip that I found I like using um, at the very end of these paintings with my watercolor pencils. All right, so moving on to the very last part of this painting process, and this is another little tip or trick that I wanted to share with you, which maybe you could find useful. I've just really liked finishing up my watercolor pencil projects with this little technique. Um, and basically it's using a scrap piece of watercolor paper as a paint mixing palette especially in the very last part of your painting process when you're really trying to push those darkest darks um, as much as possible. I've found that mixing on my scrap piece of watercolor paper like this allows me to more easily lay down that color in a more saturated state. And at the same time, I really like the use of final little abstract shapes uh, that can be easily laid down with your paintbrush versus going in with your watercolor pencil and creating more marks and more texture. So this is completely a taste thing. If you like more painterly qualities, then this could be something that you could find helpful. And of course, for this part of the process, the colors that I am mixing together on that scrap piece of watercolor paper are my darkest red, and my brown and my darkest green and my brown just to push those darkest darks. I am keeping everything very loose, jumping around from area to area, staying away from the look of heavy stark looking shapes or lines, really staying away from the look of any sort of outline, which outlines should not be created when we're trying to achieve any sort of realism. Uh, because they lead to flatness and it just retracts from the realism that we're trying to go for here. So keep everything loose, keep everything irregular, and really at this point in the process, less is more.
Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, please make sure to check out everything that I'm offering over at my Patreon membership website because for a very small amount a month, you get immediate access to my most exclusive resources in the form of real-time, step-by-step, fully narrated tutorials that I don't share anywhere else. All of the tutorials that I share over on Patreon include my downloadable outline sketch, my high-resolution reference photos, and my supply lists, including the list of specific colors that I use for the piece on hand, Patreon community members also have access to my weekly sketchbook prompts, which are designed to help you stay consistent and making progress as an artist. There's also a library of classes on art fundamentals that now has over 20 classes in it and that gets added to each and every month. Monthly live Q&A sessions with me in which community members get to ask me anything they'd like feedback from me on your work, and much, much more. So go ahead and check it out. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things. So you can pick whichever one you need. I'm gonna make sure to leave a link to that down below in the description box. All right, everyone, that is gonna do it for today's video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, that you learned something new, or that you found it inspiring. If you did like it, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and allows more artists to get to know about my channel. Thank you so very much for watching today. I really, really appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments for me, make sure to leave them down below in the comment section. I always love hearing from you guys and read every single one of your comments. Don't forget to subscribe so that I can see you next week for another video and stay inspired. Bye guys.